Hey guys, welcome to the All Things Running Podcast. It's Jacob here, and today I sit down and talk with the founder of Sweat Elite and also coach for Best Athletics, Matt Fox, who I've actually had on before. So if you guys haven't listened or watched to that podcast episode, go ahead and go back and, and listen to that one first because I go into the background on him and we talk more about his founding of Sweat Elite and all of that. Uh, this one was more of a follow up. Uh, from the Berlin Marathon he raced a couple weeks back. So we talk about that. Uh, we also talk about his coaching for Best Athletics. And we close it out by talking about a little bit more on Sweat Elite, some questions that I had that I weren't wasn't able to ask last time when we talked. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. Uh, and it ended up being normal length episode. I thought it was maybe going to be a little shorter, but we, got, we just got chatting. And next thing you know, it was 55 minutes later. So nonetheless, I hope you guys enjoy and uh if you do support the podcast share it around uh put it on your instagram you know put it out there so we can grow this thing together uh, i appreciate all the support guys and as always enjoy and i'll see you in the next one hey matt hey Jack- jacob how you doing i'm good how are you welcome back on for round two man yeah thanks so much for the invite i enjoyed the the first one very much and uh happy to be back yeah the microphone and uh everything yeah, yeah. I'm uh you were kinda of choppy there. What what did you say just to make sure I hear what you right? Oh, I just said well that answers the question. I said, is everything okay with the microphone? Oh yeah, yeah, it's good now. <laughs> it just okay, cut okay. out while you were asking that, ironically. Oh, okay. But <laughs> I think it was just I think it was getting getting set up. Yeah, we're good now. How's your uh, time off been? Looks like you enjoyed yourself a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I went to Oktoberfest straight after after Berlin Marathon and uh yeah i guess i'm on my eighth eighth day off now kind of forced in a way because uh my my hamstring's not 100 percent. but uh, i was actually planning on taking um well my plan was to take three weeks off with london marathon sort of in the middle of that uh just as a as a, uh, as, a okay. as a fun run to do with some friends uh which was two days ago i was i had an entry but unfortunately uh couldn't line up because my hamstring was still uh was still not great so yeah i plan to take probably two to three weeks off and then uh, and then start another marathon build Oh, that's, that's probably feels like a long time for you right now. I mean, probably were, you were thinking to get back into things sooner, but at the same time, I, that might be really nice. Also, you get a full re- refresh. Man, I, you know, I learned a very valuable lesson in 2021 where I was, where I was forced essentially to take, uh, take some time off um, when I was dealing with an Achilles injury for a long time. Uh, and I, and I took five weeks totally off uh, because I was just so sick of running in pain and, and I bounced back from from that, and and very proudly ran my my best marathon time uh, sixteen weeks later. And so I think I, uh, and that was after five weeks com- completely off running and not not running at all. Wow. And and I think I learned from that 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 the full the full rest period where you completely have a reset both mentally and physically. You know, some people worry that that's a bad thing and they might not be able to bounce back from that anytime soon. But, uh, you know, my experience was that I think it was really good for me because when I returned to running after that five weeks. I, uh, I, I felt, you know, all of my niggles and pains had gone away. I, I, I looked at a couple of videos of me running a couple of weeks later that someone filmed and I just looked more relaxed in the upper body and shoulders. And, mm-hmm. and I think that, you know, I'm going to take another few weeks off now. I don't think maybe five is necessary, but three is probably ideal. And, uh, I think it's going to be a perfect little reset before, before another four month build towards Seville where, where, you know, like I said, in 2021, it took four months to run to 20 off, uh, off five weeks uh, of rest. So three weeks rest and then four months and hopefully go into 20. Yeah. All right. I like that trajectory you got going there. You, you kind of answered one of my questions. Cause I was curious to hear about your future plans for racing. So it looks like you're doing the Seville marathon. Um, that's, 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 that's exciting. Nice. Yeah. Did you, when did you establish this plan? Like, was it right out to the race? You were already like, oh man, I didn't run sub 220. I got to get on it. And you just looked or what, when did you plan that out? Uh, being, being a, uh, being a somewhat obsessed marathoner now, of course, we were, already, <laughs> we were already planning the next one before the last one, which is when you know that you've lost your mind. Um, so yeah, now we were already, we were already thinking about uh, a marathon in, uh, in the first few months of next year. And, uh, due to a few, so I, I've, I'm in London now and I, I will be here for the next, uh, next little while. And, and I really wanted to do a, a training build up with Nick Bester, who, um, who obviously I've been, I've been, uh, having these little rival, fun rivalries with over the last uh, little while. 
and uh, due, due to some commitments of his own, he he wants to do one uh, before in the middle of March. So we looked at we looked at uh, at a few options, and and Tokyo was one, but we we missed the entry for that. We were too late by a couple of days, and then uh, we looked into the calendar and noticed Seville was there on the February the nineteenth. And uh, I've I've known a few very good athletes, uh, you know, Olympic level athletes that have run very fast there. And the more we looked into it, the more we realized that was going to be a good option because the weather's almost always good there in February. It's almost always uh, 45 to 55 Fahrenheit in the mornings in Seville in February. And uh, it's, a dead, it's, it's actually labeled the flattest course in Europe, I think, according oh, wow. to the elevation game. I mean, you know, once, once, you, once you're sort of under uh, 150 feet of elevation game, you could argue they're almost all the same. There's no real advantage, but it, it is actually the, 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 the lowest amount of elevation gain in a course in Europe. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Wow, like even ahead of Berlin. Yeah, Berlin's Berlin's got. Um, so sorry, I'm going to talk in meters uh, for a minute, which will probably not. Uh, uh, it's more effective uh, anyway. It's a better system. <laughs> yeah, I think Berlin's 65 meters elevation gain, and I think Seville is like okay. 20, 25. But oh, wow. you know, when you're talking that low in elevation gain, you don't really notice it. It's it's just very yeah. small rises, and you know, Kipchoge keeps proving it over over and over again that Berlin's super quick. So I don't think it really matters when you're under when you're under like 80 meters elevation gain. I think there's it doesn't really matter what what, what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the field will still be very competitive at Seville. I mean, a lot of people, I, I'm under the impression that a lot of people fast go to that race in, yeah. in Europe. So I think that's a great race selection. There um, was a, in 2020, just before COVID started, you know, the, the Olympic qualifying period was op open at that point. And a whole lot of guys, there was, I don't know exactly how many, but I think it was around 30 or even more guys ran under 2.11.30 there. <laughs> so, wow oh my yeah. gosh well because it timed perfectly for the olympics that were originally planned to be in august 2020 of course they ultimately got postponed but in february you know that was six months before so a lot of guys in europe uh all sort of agreed i guess amongst each other six months earlier or five months earlier to do that one and mm. uh yeah there's some pretty cool videos and photos on the internet of, of them all celebrating at the end because a whole lot one of my friends from uh from denmark tyson nyhurst he ran 210 54 and he was he was not in the top 15 i think he was in the 20s so um yeah it's crazy deep and uh, it just proves that it's a very fast course yeah but it's gonna be a great race to get after it again and go for that sub 220 man yeah, um, man, I've, I've, uh, I'm not going to stop until I until I until I get there. I love it, man. I love it. You're not you're not stepping down, which is great. Um, yeah. I was a little worried you'd be a little down after that, which is why I've been I was hesitant to ask you anything about the Berlin. But uh, yeah. I'm sure you're probably like feeling okay about it now, and you're kind of over it, like mentally. Yeah, a few people sort of mentioned that you know that that you know, how do I feel about it? I mean. I was really surprised. I'm gonna I'm gonna work backwards here a little bit. But when I when I crossed the line and saw two twenty four on the clock from up from hundred meters out, um, because I ran the race with an injured hamstring, um, which presented itself around two weeks earlier, um, and sort of was good and then bad and then good and then bad and sort of kept kept persisting. Um, I was actually really proud that I finished in that time because um, through the race, I, I had a number of moments where I um, seriously considered dropping out uh, because the pain uh, and not because I, I didn't think I would break 220. I, I knew I wouldn't yeah. break 220 after, after about 15 miles because my hamstring was, um, was restricting me. But uh, I was actually uh, quite happy at the end <laughs> because I thought to myself, Wow, 224, you know, only two years ago, um, that was my best time. And to, healthy. to and to yeah, 100 percent healthy and doing a perfect training block and and being able to run 224, basically uh compensating one leg for the last uh eleven miles yeah, um yeah. was was a was a was <laughs> was something I, I was quite proud of immediately after the race. So I, you know, I didn't hit the goal and I and I and I um you know, I was, I was slightly bummed about that, but I think ultimately a few people reminded me very quickly and I knew myself that to run 224 um, semi-injured uh, and, and just being able to grit through the, the pain and the, and, the, and the times where I wondered if I'd get to the end, I think I was really, really proud of that. And um, yeah, no, I wasn't, I wasn't bummed at all. Of course, the whole project was called a sub-220 project and I, and I know I can do that. And, I, and I, I think my chances of doing that would have been high if I didn't pick up the injury with, uh, I think it was, 
I think it was 12 days ago was the first time it happened. I can't remember exactly, but um, yeah. So yeah, no, I, I feel pretty content about it. And um, I was definitely motivated to, to, to recover from this and get into another block because I feel like I've sort of had the ability to break 220 for almost a year now. It's just a bunch of things just have gotten in the way, like cramping and, and maybe some excessive yeah. travel hindered hindered the Valencia attempt where I was driving all around Spain for the days leading up to Valencia when I <laughs> when I DNF last year. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm 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 all good, mate. But thanks for thanks for checking in. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you're all right. And I mean, you should be proud of that time. It's definitely very impressive running 224.37 despite having your hamstring issues. And you mentioned it was as early as 10k in that you started to feel it coming on a little bit. No, well, ultimately, I, f I felt it from very early on, but it didn't really bother me. Uh, it, it started bothering me. I, I would have called it a one out of 10 pain until 10K. Then it sort of became about a two out of 10 pain for a while. And then at 25K, um, I took a stride um, that, that obviously my hamstring didn't like. And from then on, it became more like a sort of a five out of 10 pain. Mm through to the very end when it was probably a bit more than that in the final stages. But, and the reason why I think it became more than that in the final stages is because I took a, I took a pretty heavy duty painkiller a few hours before the race. And I think that wore off. Oh, oh man. <laughs> oh, that's not a place you want to be before a big marathon is popping painkillers. No, to... first, time, first time I've done that. Um, and I don't really advise that. Really? But... First time. First time I've taken a painkiller in a race. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think I've taken an anti-inflammatory tablet before, but this is the first time I've taken a prescription um painkiller just to yeah. numb the brain and that was a difficult decision to make and i don't know if i would advise people to do that normally but um i did have a feeling that it wasn't a muscle tear which which is basically confirmed now it's it's actually a, a more than i haven't had an mri but I, I'm, I'm almost certain it's a nerve uh irritation in my lower back which is which is also filtering through to my hamstring i've had a consultation from a highly experienced physiotherapy um physiotherapist recently um and, and i and i had a good feeling that it wasn't something that would have gotten ex a lot worse if i ran through it um it was more just going to irritate it and probably inf you know make it uh in inflame it for a little while which which is the case because now when i'm walking around and go for a very short jog i, I can tell that it's healing and it's almost it's it's coming good and i think in i think in a week or two it should be fine i just i just hope it's not a case where because in the days leading up to Berlin, I jogged and it was fine. Uh, I could feel it as a one out of 10 pain. It didn't get any worse. But what I didn't do is I didn't test it over any sort of speed in the final days. And, and as soon as I started running 515, 520 mile pace in the race, I felt it come on. So um, yeah, just hopefully it's not going to bother me moving forward, but I'm doing everything I can. Good. Yeah. Are you going to be keeping going to that physiotherapist over the next couple of months just to make sure you're good to go for yeah, several? Yeah, a very yeah. kind physiotherapist called Nathan from um, the US has reached out, and he'll be he'll be helping me every week, giving me exercises and stuff. And, and he, even in the first few days, I've noticed that they've been helping. So, but nice. yeah, he went through, he went through a full video, a full one hour consultation via Zoom, and made me do all these movements and exercises, and concluded that it's it's most likely a uh, there's a very long terminology for it, which I I don't remember right now, but it's it's basically a, an, an issue with my lower back. Okay. Um, it seemed like with the exercises I was doing, I was, I was not really um, moving in a very straight or efficient way. And, um, and he reckons that that's presenting the pain in the, in the upper hamstring. So he said it could be yeah. that. And it could also be a case of sort of mild tendinopathy in there as well. He said it, could, it could be maybe a bit of both. So yeah, we'll see, but um, hopefully, hopefully we'll be all good in a couple of weeks when we get started with the Seville block. Yeah. Yeah. Did you experience like hamstring injuries in your past? Like with when you were an 800 guy or anything, or is this just kind of come um, on recently? I, I pulled my hamstring a couple of times, um, back in the, in the 800 meter, 1500 meter days. Yeah. But they were all pretty minor and I always, you know, recovered pretty well from them, but this is in a different spot The the, yeah. the pulled hamstring or the muscle issues were normally in the belly, right in the middle. This is like right up near my bum, like in between my okay. in the insertion point between the hamstring and the glute. Um, yeah. So it's a different spot, and uh, that that knowing the pain was in there basically told me that it most likely wasn't a muscle strain or a muscle tear. Because if it was a muscle strain or tear, I was not lining up. Because if I lined up and ran a marathon with that, it would most likely 
destroy the hamstring for a long time. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 the position that it was in was telling me most likely it was a ligament or a tendon or a nerve. And, and those sorts of things can normally be run through to some extent, I believe. I hope that I'm uh, <laughs> giving correct information there. But yeah, <laughs> obviously you know, with, with mine, it's been okay because I'm almost sure now nine days on that um i haven't I, i'm barely sure <laughs> I, I hope this ages well but i'm fairly sure i haven't done long-term damage to my hamstring but i got wood i'm knocking on wood over here <laughs> if i'm if i'm uh, posting on uh, on strava or instagram in a couple of months saying i'm still struggling then i'm obviously wrong but um let's let's see yeah no i think i think you're on a good trajectory here and i'm excited for several that's going to be fun to see you get after that too um because i think a lot of us knew that or at least thought that you were in sub 220 shape without a doubt so uh, yeah I think-, I really think i was it's 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 unfortunate because i feel like i was probably in sub 220 shape from three or four weeks out mm-hmm. from the race as well so it was a bit of a bummer that just sustaining that fitness led to the injury in a way but um mm-hmm. you know i think i said in my last uh, episode of the series that this is this is what comes with uh you know i used to when i was a bit younger i used to get shocked and a little bit um disappointed and so forth when i pick up an injury and of course you're going to be disappointed when you pick up an injury but you know let's look at this objectively for a minute and realize that uh what you're putting yourself through when you're training for a marathon properly is uh is something that the, the body is going to struggle to get through you know so i think picking up these little injuries and niggles is is something that you have to accept and and something that just comes with the with the package and um, mine just came at a very unfortunate time that 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 stuck with me through to the race you know many people get lucky you'd say and then pick up the niggle maybe earlier in the block and they recover from it and they line up healthy you know that's happened to me before yeah. this was just unlucky that i had it you know starting on the start line and you know you, you know you live and learn and um i think in this case i don't think i really learned anything i think it was just a bit of bad luck um, yes, maybe I pushed, um, maybe I was riding the line of overtraining potentially, uh, especially given that when I ran 220, I probably averaged close to 70 miles a week with no gym. This time it was close to 90 okay. miles a week with gym. So that is a big step up in terms of, um, what I'm putting my body through. So, you know, but now that I've been through that and I learned where my limit is, I think that this block, uh, moving forward i could probably replicate a very similar amount of mileage with jim and i think my body will be able to um deal with it i hope so let's see yeah yeah okay um were you mentally how are you coping with the hamstring thing leading into the race it must have been tough on you to yeah, kind of have that pop up with 12 days out having known like you're probably in sub 220 shape that was pretty stressful yeah um so yeah, I, I, that that track session that was I think episode ten could be wrong um, that I that I pulled out of the last two mile repeats. Right, um, I recovered from that quite fast. Um, but then what happened was I had my last running workout on the Tuesday morning before Berlin Marathon, so five days before I did it with Freddie Ovet in Spain. And yes, that's right. We did six by one k, sort of starting at about marathon goal pace and working down to you know, whatever we felt was best. And so I finished that, felt great. And then the afternoon I had my last strength session, which involved no weights. It only involved uh, exercises on the ground with body movements. And I was doing the exercise where you're lying flat on your back on the ground with your, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, pressure in, on your heels and on your back. And I was lifting yes. my glutes and hamstring right. up in the air and putting pressure on my hamstrings and glutes. And I had three sets of 20 on both sides. And in the middle of the second set, I think it was rep 10 or 11, I felt my right hamstring twinge quite hard. And I just stopped immediately, stood up and thought, okay, the first thing I thought was, okay, this is how it felt in that track session. And I recovered from that quick. So I hope I'm going to be okay. But then I woke up the next day and had to travel from Spain to Berlin on the Wednesday. And I knew then that it wasn't the same. It was worse because I had, to, I had to walk up and down a lot of stairs at the airport and uh, at the, both airports. And I told uh, Reem, my girlfriend who was traveling with me, I said, you know, this is, this is not good. This is much worse than it was before. And um, um, at this stage, I would, I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm going to be okay in four days, but we'll see. And I took a few days off and then jogged um, to, I think twice, I think it was on the Thursday, no, sorry, on the Thursday and Friday and jogging was okay, but I could, I could still feel it. And so, you know, I don't know. I think it was stressful, but at the same time, again, looping back to that whole um, very philosophical idea of like, this is part of it. You know, this is part of it. And I think because also I've been coaching for a while now, 
And I'm always telling people that I coach when they get a niggle, this is, this is part of it. You, we have to learn how to get through these niggles and these pains because, you know, we're, we're training really hard here. So I think part of that, you know, was in my mind too, that, Hey, I've been advocating to people that I coach for a while now that this is part of it. So this is part of it. Don't get surprised and don't get disappointed. Just try and deal with it. And I think I knew on Friday I was going to be able to line up. Um, but uh, I had no idea what it would feel like in the race. And, you know, in retrospect, I think I probably, the only thing I regret is probably I took the painkiller two, uh, two hours before the race. I should have taken it on the start line. I don't know what I was thinking with that <laughs> because, it wore, because it wore off halfway through the race, I think. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if, if, yeah. I, if I'd taken it, I know this is probably quite uh, irresponsible of me saying this because you shouldn't really run with painkillers, but let, let, let's, let's be honest. I did do a whole video series and, and tens of thousands of people watched it. So part of that was in the back of my mind. I can't, I, I have to line up if I can here. Um, yeah. and so I wish I'd taken the thank you on the start line. Cause that very well may have, um, that may very well may have meant I could have run in, in, in less pain for longer. Um, yeah. but you know, you know who knows <laughs> then again, I, I, don't, I don't really want to finish this whole block saying well the only thing i learned was i took the painkiller too early <laughs> that's not really a good lesson so yeah anyways and again you know it could have like suppressed some issues there and you could have run through it and really made it worse so it's like exactly, <laughs> exactly. good point that, that's 100 percent true as well yeah. yeah i i remember in high school we i was like the advil guy and i would everyone would just take Advil from me before races, like ibuprofen. Like, um, we would just be passing it around and popping it before races. Like every race, even if we didn't have really? any pains, we were doing it. I don't know why it was like our high school thing. Uh, and then I just didn't stop that because actually I looked into it and it's like not the best thing to take before race because it's a blood thinner and it can yeah. like make you a little more dehydrated. Um, yeah. So we granted we were doing 5K, so it probably didn't matter. But nonetheless, it was pretty funny looking back on that when you were mentioning at like the ibuprofen team pot painkiller. It just made me laugh. But um, <laughs> damn, man, um, I had no, I had no idea it was a thing. That's yeah, like I said before, that's the first time I've done it, and I don't really. Oh, 100 yeah, percent, man. I, I, I feel like uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll preface again by saying. I don't feel uh, very responsible by saying this because I wouldn't really advise people do it. But mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that like you pointed out just before that if you do take these painkillers and, and run through it, you can, you can really put yourself at risk because yeah. you're not noticing when something's, um, you know, going wrong in your body a lot of the time. But uh, you know, the painkillers don't completely mask the pain. I mean, I took that heavy duty one and still felt it from the start. So, but it obviously numbed it quite a bit. So, yeah. Yeah. The other thing about Avil is it does like stunt your recovery a little bit. Uh, so I totally avoid it in my marathon buildup because yeah, it helps with inflammation, but so many other things can do that. You can ice yeah. or, or just rest and get blood flow to the area. So there's a lot of other things you can do other than take Avil, although people like the instant cure. So yeah. people will continue to take their Avil. I, I know some, I know a guy who ran for the pit team who was really talented and still is who would pop Avil before every workout. I'm not going to call it a name, but <laughs> He's a very pull talented athlete. Pull him out. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. Yeah, don't do this, people. Don't listen to us. This is not a good idea. Yeah, uh, yeah. Listen to a professional. Sometimes you've got to do what you got to do, I guess. And uh, yeah. I mean, part of it for me was like, at this point, when I was talking, when I was thinking about taking the painkiller, I thought, I actually don't have anything else planned right now after this race. Like there was Seville in mind, but we hadn't booked anything or confirmed it. Okay. So I just thought, you know, I've committed so much to this build up. I've invested so much time and effort in this series. You know, I'm lining up. I'm, I'm, I'm taking this rest this time. Yeah. 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 Running's a tough, tough thing, especially for the marathon. You just, you get yeah. hurt and it's part of the game. And man, it's been tough on me, like with this back thing, definitely hard to overcome injuries. Even, you know, even when you think, okay, I don't I need running anymore. This is fine. Like I don't, if I get injured, whatever it it's when you get injured, it, it can be really hard on you and kind of yeah. surprise you. So it's definitely tough going through these type of things. So, you know, I hope for the best recovery for you. Hopefully you'll be back at it soon. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate that. And hopefully your, you know, how how's things with your your injury at the moment? Uh pretty I'm pretty optimistic about it since since yeah. last time we talked, it's it's been it's gotten a lot better. I actually just did fifty minutes yesterday with uh two miles uh at a up tempo, six fifteen a mile, which nice. it's crazy how like bad that felt. Like like yeah. a year back I did like eight mile tempo at five twenty six per mile, like for before my marathon and and now I'm doing like two miles at six fifteen, and it's kind of tough. So that again, that's just a part of you know getting hit oh, with an injury that took you out for a while. Like it's gonna. 
where you are right now is kind of fun in a way because you're going to see so much rapid progression over the next couple of weeks and months. Yeah. Getting yeah. Back to that, getting, getting back to that 525-ish, you know, tempo pace. So I actually, you know, in a strange, weird way, I kind of like starting after a long time off because every workout you you shift like a few percent uh, faster yeah. and faster. Whereas when you get to your peak fitness or thereabouts, it's much harder to see those gains. And um, yeah, so it's it's it's, it's going to be cool to watch. I've seen a couple of your runs pop up on Strava lately. So yeah, it's good that you're getting back there. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Like heart rate's down 20 from when I started my easy runs. Like I'm going 30 seconds faster a mile and my heart rate's down 20 beats per minute from you know what I was doing before. So it's it, it's definitely, you're right. It, you see a lot of gains, which is nice. Yeah. So, yes. uh, you know, I got to look at it that way. Got to look at it positively. But yeah. anyway, let's keep talking about you. So the next section I want to talk about was uh, your best athletics coaching because uh, yeah. I know you, you have a bit of a coaching background. I saw that you were head coach for a company called UFIT in Singapore mm-hmm. in 2015 to 2016. Um, so, yeah, well, tell me about your background in coaching. When did you kind of start? Was it at that opportunity in Singapore or? No, I'm, you know, I've actually been coaching since, uh, probably since I was about, so I'm 35 now, probably for almost 15 years, but it's, it's almost always been casually just with some friends or friends of friends that have asked me. I've, I've very rarely taken on official coaching roles, uh, but even back when I was a middle distance guy, I think from when I was about 21, I was helping some younger athletes. I was actually a coach at the Southport School in Australia uh, when I was 19 and 20, I was an assistant coach there. And, uh, and I reckon I've, I've never had a, 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 a day or a week where I haven't been coaching someone. It's always normally been between three and maybe six friends, or as I said, friends of friends or random people that have asked me through Instagram or whatnot. Um, and it, yeah, in Singapore, I, I met um, a guy called James Forrester, who was the head of UFIT, which is a very quickly, very fast growing company at the time. And he was looking for a run coach and he knew my background in sort of being in the you know, uh, Australian national championship final a few times. And he asked me to come on board and that was, that was quite, quite good fun. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I met, uh, and then, uh, you know, I left Singapore uh, shortly after that and, and started Sweat Elite and then, uh, yeah, I continued to coach some friends along the way. And then I met, uh, I met Nick Bester last year at Valencia Marathon in December and we both sort of knew of each other before that. And, and he shared his, uh, you know, his best athletics. Uh, so he started best athletics about, uh, about a year before that. And yeah. he told me how quickly it was rapidly growing and how he needed more coaches to come on board soon. And, uh, and, and we basically, you know, ended up agreeing that, uh, with, that Sweat Elite would partner with Best Athletics as being the coaching arm because we were already looking at, at creating one of them ourselves. But I thought that would be a better fit. And I've come on as a coach and I, I coach uh, up, to, up to sort of 20, uh, 25 people at a time now. And, you know, people sort of um, do, do blocks of training and then take a rest and, 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 and join us, uh, you know, after, afterwards when they're, maybe uh, sign up for another event, but no, it's, it's awesome. It's good fun. Best athletics is growing very, very quickly. I think when I met Nick, it was a little under a hundred members. Now it's approaching 200 members. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, only, only nine months later. So um, he's doing a fantastic job here in the UK of, of, of growing it. Now we're really trying to figure out how best to, to grow it internationally because within the UK, it's already quite popular. Um, and so I'm obviously I'm helping a little bit with that with Sweat Elite's uh, audience. But it's great. I, I love coaching, coaching people. I feel like especially I have a, a strong interest in helping people sort of achieve, uh, you know, any, any distance and any, any ability. But I feel like the most interesting thing to me is men and women that are trying to become sort of sub elite level. So right, sort of around that 30 minutes for 10 K or 29 for 10 K or two, two fifty, sort of two eighteen to two thirty male marathoner or sort of 230 to 240 female i feel like that's the spot that and it's probably mainly because i've just been through years of, of, of reaching that point myself starting as a 259 marathoner and now 220 so i feel like i've just learned so many things and and i most of the people i coach are around that level but i do coach some others that are they're a little bit behind that and no, it's, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. And it's something that I, I enjoy. Uh, I, I really enjoy helping people achieve their, their running goals. It's, it's great. Yeah. It seems like I, when I talked to Nick, it sounded like, so uh, you guys are really blowing up. Best athletics yeah. is really on, on the come up here. I mean, yeah, he said, he mentioned, I think there was 140 something athletes. You guys were coaching at the time, uh, mm. but you had over 160 and that was when we talked about a month back. So 
Yeah. I'm sure those numbers yeah, have that, risen. That since 160 then. Has, has, has kept going to, I don't know the exact number, but it's almost approaching 200 now because the London Marathon was last weekend and we've had a, a whole lot more join. So, yeah, it's it's great. And I'm actually recording this podcast from Nick's living room. He's, he's uh, just next door. So we are. Oh, here. nice. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. We, tell we, tell we, him uh, I said hi. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> um, so, how many, I, I think you might have mentioned this. I think you might have 15 to 20, but how many athletes are you coaching right now? I think right now it's 16 and sort of always around that, that 20 mark. Yeah. Um, okay. Some people stay on year round and just, and just continue. Some people uh, do a, a three month block to a race and then take a few months off and then rejoin. Or oh. So yeah, I'm quite interested in around that 20 to 25 uh, mark. I, Nick coaches over a hundred, but because I do the sweat elite oh. content as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. He, he He's a, He's very ambitious with uh, yeah with this, and he's he's very passionate about the the people that he coaches too. So, but yeah, because obviously I've got my own content um, job with Sweat Elite, uh, I, I can't take on anywhere near that that many. But uh, twenty to twenty five is probably the sweet spot for me. And um, yeah, I, I don't tend to. We, we do have four coaches at at, uh, at Best Athletics, and there's there's two others in in Dan and and Sam, and they tend to take on the the people that are more sort of in the recreational uh, space, maybe people that are okay. doing marathon for the first time, or or you know trying to run a five k in under twenty five minutes or whatnot. Um, you know, I, I tend to take on the people that are that are maybe aiming at a sub elite time or or a, or a competitive time. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you kind of like what range of ability levels did you take on and about your at the athlete recruitment process there, but it sounds to me like you kind of, you look at an application that comes in and you, you know, you say, okay, this person should go here because maybe they're, you know, not as serious or if they're a little more serious, they might go to you. It sounds like you kind of break it up a little bit by ability mm-hmm. level, generally speaking. Yeah. If, if the, if the, if the customer client doesn't have a preferred coach, then we'll normally break it up like that. Yeah. 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 So what range of distances do you cover right now? I mean, is there anyone wanting to do like a mile or 5k or is it mostly? I don't have any, I don't I have had in the past, um, people approach for, uh, middle distance, but at the moment it's, it's 5k through to marathon. Um, okay. I would say most of the people I'm coaching right now are training for a marathon, probably 70%, but there's a couple of them that are trying to, you know, improve their five and 10k and then maybe have a marathon in mind for next year. Mm. Uh, but most of them are preparing for marathons. So uh i've got a couple doing uh valencia um i've got one doing tokyo a couple that have just gotten into boston so yeah it really arranges nice. um yeah but i would say uh, I, I would love to actually take on more middle distance athletes because obviously i spent seven years in that space but um i don't know it's i think the rec- the, the, the the recreational or non-elite world is is obviously has a much larger participation um in in the space of 10k through to or 5k through to marathon just given the the events that are on offer and you know if you don't if you don't make it as an elite um middle distance runner there's there's not a lot of opportunities to race uh in good races at least year round um on the track it tends to be just in a few months of the year so i think that's why people gravitate to the roads because you know they're they're on all that's one thing i love about road racing and marathons is they're all year um, which is awesome. So you're not, you're not, you know, you're not restricted to this small window of, of I mean, obviously there's indoor, but, but um, if you're talking about outdoor, yeah. it's only really a three or four months a year, which is, which is a bit of a bummer really, because if, you know, yeah. if you don't, if, if you're injured through that period or you, or you don't run as well as you would have liked, then you've got to wait so long to, to race again. And yeah, so most people are in the, in the longer distances. Yeah. I think that's the tough thing about like college is that everything's very broken up into track and cross country and indoor. Yes. And if you're injured for one of those seasons, I mean, you're basically done. Like you're not going to be able to perform at the level you, you want to perform. Yes. That was like the story of my life in, at Pitt. Like I always got injured when I like, I always had these big goals and then I would get injured. And it's, you know, it's like, realistically, you're not going to be able to perform at the highest level you want to. Uh, yeah. when you get injured like that and then it ruins yeah. the whole season so yeah. i i do think it's really nice coming out of college to be able to have that freedom to you know have an all full open year and uh, just road racing and stuff i think it's yeah but yeah. um i would be curious to hear about your training camp in spain you had like well i guess it was maybe four three weeks out at this point three and a half yeah, um, yeah best uh, athletics I, uh, have, are organizing training camps I, I think that was the second one we've organized i didn't go to the first one but we, we actually the, the meeting i just had with nick pride and recording this podcast was that was one of the topics and we're we're planning at the moment on doing on doing two a year 
um, probably one in March and one in September. And it's, it's, it is, it is restricted to, to best athletics members, but uh, it was, it was really good fun. Um, there was about 25 of us down in Torrevea, just outside of Alicante in Spain, doing a, doing a seven day training camp. And it was just such a, such a good time. Great, great vibes and great people. And, you know, it's very social um all abilities there was uh there was a there was a 68 minute half marathon female there which wow. is one of the best in Jeez. the uk sam harrison she came along um i think she's third or fourth fastest all time i think in the uk and then and then we had people you know aiming to run 345 for a marathon there so it was it was a big you know range of abilities and uh it was such a good time and i'm actually um uh, most likely going to have a bit of a bigger role in organizing the next one in, in, in March, which is probably going to be in Portugal. So uh, oh, stay tuned cool. about that. Yeah. So uh, it's, cool. it's, it's great. A little it's, incentive uh, to become a best athletics member, maybe there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's cool, man. Yeah, no, I, that's definitely something I want to do at some point, go to a training camp. Um, I know Lu- Luis Orta does the, um, he does the one in um, Kenya, Yes, um, which is super cool. He does that one. I think he's looking to do it twice a year uh, down the road, um, which is super cool. So between those two, I got some options now. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Kenya is a whole other, other thing. I, I mean, the, the, I mean, Lewis, I'm a, I'm a good friend of Lewis and I, everything I've seen about his camps, they look phenomenal. Um, but going to Kenya to train is very different to going Absolutely. to Spain or Portugal in terms of the, yeah. the altitude and the, I mean, I love, I love them both. I've been to both. Uh, I've been to over six training camps in Spain and, and five in Kenya. So wow. quite experienced in both, but um, gee, they, yeah, they couldn't be any more uh, different to each other in terms of the, uh, the, the altitude, the hills, the uh you know the, and also just the, the the way of life there but they're, they're both unbelievable experiences but uh yeah lewis's camps look unreal i actually want to join him on one at some point but um we'll see yeah all right we'll have to line that up so i go too when you go yeah yeah <laughs> what's the uh scope of is it just europe for the scope of these training camps for now for best athletics yeah see most people that are coming on these work you know work full-time or they have families and so i mean it's obviously yeah. the same with lewis's ones but um yeah i think we're looking at a direct flight um to okay. these ones because they're only six or seven days long and um yeah we have floated the idea of doing something in kenya at some point and we may do one at some point but it's nothing locked in yet but okay it's a lot easier to to get people to sign up to ones when it's a it's a two-hour flight away and it's yeah, that's quite easy to to return home if you need to for whatever reason so but kenya i mean i have actually hosted four camps through sweat elite pre-covid this is um you know with with about eight to 15 people coming on the sweat elite camps and um yeah they're they're they're, uh, <laughs> they're a bit more difficult to organize mainly because um kenya's you know kenya's kenya it's the world and yeah. it's a lot less organized and there's a lot more uh you know yeah less rules over there i guess so yeah okay, very different experiences for sure yeah, sure yeah uh one more question about you know best athletics you're coaching yeah. there uh, what, what's your level of involvement in your athletes? You know, you said you have about 16 right now. That's, that is a lot of athletes to coach. How does that work? Like, how can you do that while also being sweat elite, you know, doing the things for sweat elite that you do? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite, it's, it's quite straightforward. Um, I spend, you know, one day a month just making the, making the plans. And then I'm very lucky that all, all of my, <laughs> all of my clients are uh, very easygoing and they're not, uh, they're not overly, uh, <laughs> They're not uh, too high maintenance. So, you know, and I respond to them all on WhatsApp. I normally set aside half an hour a day at some point to, 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 to respond to all the messages of my, of my clients. And, um, and, and it's worked out well. Oftentimes some clients I don't really hear from at all through the month because nothing goes wrong and they from follow the plan that I have any injuries. And, and some of the clients, like I've got two at the moment that are both dealing with little, little issues that they're able to run through. One's got a slight knee pain that he's working out. Um, and the other one's got a, a minor issue with his lower back of which they've both been treated with physios and they both actually um, uh, have had them on and off for, for some time. Um, but yeah, so I, I communicate with them and adjust the plans as I go. And I think it's just about prioritizing your time and, and making sure that, uh, you know, setting aside the amount of time in the months to, to get the training plans done. But, you know, there's absolutely no way I'd be able to take on 50 or more. That would just be um, too time consuming with my other work. Yeah. But I think upwards of 20 to 25 is, is, is fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Gee, I wonder how Nick's doing a hundred. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. crazy. Oh man. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. I don't either because he doesn't only coach. Like he, 
you know, he he's also the captain of Adidas in 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 London, so he takes some Adidas training sessions, and um, you know, he's he's also extremely talented at at uh, develop at business development. So he's managed to partner with a whole lot of brands here in London. He sort of does all that stuff as well. So, and he's you know he's he's got a young daughter who's just uh who's who's, who's very young too. So yeah, don't ask me how he does it, and and he still runs uh 220 marathons. So yeah, geez, <laughs> man, that's crazy. Um. All right, last section. I just had some follow-up questions about Sweat Elite that I didn't get around cool. to last time. I think I shot one of them to you over Instagram after the meeting last time because I wanted to know. But, you know, first of all, like, I was curious if any athlete has ever reached out to you to make a video happen or if, if you, you've always been the one to reach out to them. It has happened a couple of times where, um, yeah, not, not I wouldn't say it happens very often, but I would say it's probably three or 4% of the time it's it's happened where an athlete has has been like, oh, you're in this area or you're in the, you know, you're in the UK. I'd be, I'd be interested in, in, in being featured in your channel. Um, but more often than not, it's us reaching out for sure. Yeah. How has it been uh, videoing Sam, Sam Long's training? That, that had, that has to be super cool. And it seems like you're a big fan of him. I am a big fan of Sam. Um, I knew, you know, I, I watched a bunch of videos on, on YouTube of him before I contacted him. And I just thought, yeah, <laughs> you know there's people out there that that are great at the sport but don't really uh post anywhere online they don't really put and that's that's fine you know that's old school and you know before social media and phones that's how everyone did it mm-hmm. but then there's people out there that are very inspiring and uh entertaining and uh you know sam definitely fits that that a description because he shares everything he's doing on strava and he has his own YouTube channel where he publishes, uh, I don't know exactly the frequency. It's probably every fortnight, maybe slightly more during some periods of the year. And he, he's very similar. <coughs> he's very similar to Lionel Sanders, uh, who, who's one of his main rivals in that they, they share everything. They share their image on, on YouTube and, and uh, Instagram is slightly different, but the image on YouTube is, is not polished. And it's not like this painting a picture that this person's just, everything goes perfectly. Like, Sam shares the the highs, the lows, the struggles, and everyone that you speak to about Sam, you know, they, they, they appreciate the fact that he, he very clearly has dark times and he shares them. And I think that that's why people really um, appreciate him and, and connect with him well, because we all have dark times, you know, we all struggle at some point, whether it's um, mentally or physically or both at the same time. And he just puts that all online and just says, you know, I'm, he doesn't say this but this is this is the reality is that he's one of the best in the world and he still has these moments where he 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 really struggles and Lionel Sanders is exactly the same I've been I've been watching every single one of his uh episodes Me too, man. Where he's too. meeting up with Kona yeah Kona's this weekend uh you know the, yeah. the Hawaii man and he's been publishing or at least his uh his his videographer uh Talbot Cox has been publishing a vlog every day and have you been watching them Absolutely. Anytime they come out, I watch them. He's like thinking about going home every day. I know. And leaving Kona and being like, I'm not fit enough for this race. And Lionel's yeah. like a favorite to win. And like at least twice in the last week, maybe more, he said, if this workout doesn't go well, I'm booking a flight home. <laughs> <laughs> like who does that? You know, like I just love it. I just think like this is how, this is how emotional and how, um, you know, challenging these, 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 uh, buildups can be when you're yeah. so nervous about the event. And I think that's one thing I, I really love about Sam is that he's the same. And, and when I met him in person, we just got along really well. And, you know, he, he loved the way that I was trying to break 220. And he said that, you know, if he was running for a marathon, he'd try and break 222 and, uh, 20, sorry, 220 as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, no, I think actually he specifically said he'd try and break 218, uh, which is the okay. Olympic, uh, trial standard in the U S um, and right. so he said, oh, you know, one day, hopefully we can do a, some workouts together. And I don't know, I just, we just got along with him really well. And um, he was also just, if you've watched the, the, the two videos that I've done with him on the Sweat Elite channel, he just, yeah. he just is so good at sharing everything about his nutrition and his, his everything. So he's just really giving the, uh, the, the YouTube audience um, a lot of really valuable content. Yeah, no, I think him and Lionel have, great youtube channels that everyone should check out because i mean i'm not even really like i'm not even thinking about doing a triathlon anytime soon but 
it's just cool to watch these athletes and yeah see. i have no interest in doing a triathlon either but i just love <laughs> it. it's so interesting yeah it is they, they do a great job and it, it uh, yeah they're great videos um i've been watching every single one that Lionel's put out the last week um yeah. it's fun to follow yeah he's it's funny it's just funny man he, he's is, always how funny is his coach uh gustav Eden's brother yeah, what's yeah. Uh, oh I man think. yeah Carl Eden, I think I think that's his name. He's he's hilarious as well. He's great. Yeah, so, I think I think it's good for Lionel that he has him as a coach. Yeah, for um, sure. Yeah, but uh, what has been like one of the most memorable experiences for you being you know working for Sweat Elite, being the founder? One of the most memorable experiences. Um, well, I don't know if this is related to Sweat Elite. The first thing that comes to mind is going to, this, I don't know why this shot to my head when you asked, and I, I'm a big believer in uh, just whatever comes to your head from a question. Hey, me too, man. Going to the, going to the, the sub, the, the Ineos challenge, uh, I wasn't invited or anything. Uh, I just went myself. Uh, and again, that was not really, um, we did publish a few little podcasts um, and articles about it afterwards, but uh, I wasn't part of the event at all. But I, that, for some reason that came to my mind first. I just thought that was such a, such an awesome project um and i was there in person and watched it in austria and i was very close to the finish line and got a selfie of me with the 159 40 behind the thing and i don't know that was just so phenomenal um to be to to to, i was about to say to be a part of but i wasn't really a part of it but that's the first thing that came to mind um i think the most this is probably not memorable but i think one thing that i'm really appreciating lately especially after doing this last series is how many people um, uh, are either coming up to me after a race or, or messaging me saying that my series or our content has really helped them. Um, you know, whether it's been inspirational or educational or both. Um, I think that's something that I'm just really appreciating lately. And after this series, I've, I've had a lot of people reach out and say, um, this has really helped me get back on track after an injury, or it's really helped me learn what I need to do in order to, uh, to run under 230 or whatever their goal may be. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm probably not answering the question directly because you asked what's memorable, but I think, you know, when I'm, when I'm 70 and I'm sweat elites well and truly, <laughs> uh, in the past, or well, maybe it won't be, who knows, um, but I'm assuming it will be. I think that's something that I'll look back on and go, wow, that's, that was so awesome that I was able to inspire and educate other people. I think that's the most special thing to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think your YouTube channel is, is a great inspiration for everyone because you're just seeing these athletes get after it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's definitely inspiring to see that. It makes you want to work hard so you can achieve yeah. your goals too. So, I mean, that's great. That's that's probably, that'd be awesome to see just people reaching out, and, you yeah. know, mentioning how your, your videos help them to stay yeah. motivated. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I think the most important, probably the, the reason where the time when that really picked up was after the tenth episode when I when I published the video of me dropping out of a workout, and then after the final episode where I basically shared about how the last week or two didn't go to plan, and I ran injured and I didn't hit the goal. I think that was, in a strange way, probably even more relatable than if I hit the goal, <laughs> because <laughs> because how many times do people train for a marathon and don't hit their goal? It happens more often than not, and so I yeah. think so many people were like. Oh man, that's so relatable that that um, he didn't he actually didn't hit it. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah, that's just the way of the marathon. I feel like you only see the PRs like you know those kind of pop out to you on Strava and stuff, and you kind of swipe right past the ones you maybe don't do it quite as well. Uh, you might hit him with a sorry, but you know, like you kind of only remember the PRs, but certainly like probably most of the marathon performances are not PRs because that's the way of the marathon. Um, if, you, if you, if you look at it uh, purely from statistics uh, and, and let's exclude Elliot Kipchoge here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He is somehow the most consistent marathoner of all time. Yeah. But if you put him aside, 99% of people, I would argue maybe 95, somewhere in there. Um, they, they achieve their goal one in every three marathons. Yeah. You know? or maybe one in every two. But most of the time, more often than not, it doesn't go to plan, whether they get injured in the build-up or they they have a bad day and they get stomach issues or whatnot. 
And uh, that's just that's just the odds. That's just what you're dealing with here. That that that's the odds. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit similar. I like to use the analogy now. A little bit similar to going to the casino. Now that's not the best analogy because the casino is pure luck, uh, at least for most. <laughs> um, and and a marathon isn't pure luck. But at the same time, um, I do think that uh, the odds are very similar. <laughs> Strange. Yeah, word. yeah. No, I would say so. Uh, a couple more questions, and I'll let you go, man. Uh, first of all, I think you mentioned this before, but. You have had some white house while videoing, haven't you? Yes, I've had uh, three, 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 three times I've fallen off the bike while filming. Yes, that's not too bad. I actually thought I was going to be higher than that. That's not yeah. bad. Three, three that I would call bad, and I think I've had a couple more where I've sort of come off, but I've sort of landed on my, you know, on. I haven't really come off. It's more just been a close call. I've, I've had a fair yeah. few of them. Um, yeah, but three that I've been on the ground properly, like off the bike. Yeah. Oh gosh, <laughs> I, I guess that's part of you know part of the thing like with videoing. It's kind of tough. I've done it before too, where you're trying to video with a GoPro while you're on a bike, and it's hard. It's definitely hard because you got one hand on the handlebar, the other hand trying to hold the GoPro up and trying to get different angles. And yeah. uh, you know, if you hit a bump in the road or something, I mean, and you know, when you were in Kenya, like there's probably a lot of rocks and stuff. You could hit a rock and just. So in oh. Kenya was one of my falls, which was one of the worst ones. I, I ran into someone on the track and it, and it, and, and oh. it was because he was, he was not looking. So I was going around, I was on the back straight. I was filming Morhad Amdouni, which is a, a 205 marathoner from France. He's the, he's the guy that, that uh, accidentally or not tipped all the bottles off the, off the table at the Olympics. Oh gosh. Oh gosh. Uh, the, you can look at that video, whichever way you want. I don't know if it was, yeah. if it was intentional, but anyways, I was um, going down the back straight I, and he was going about to go around the bend from 200 meters to go. And um, I looked around the bend and there was no one on the bend. There was a guy standing on the very outside of the track. And, and so I started filming, basically looking behind myself around the bend, sticking in lane four. And then 50 meters later, I was on the ground and I was for, for, for like 10 seconds. I was like, how did this happen? Like how, who? Yeah. And, then, and then there was a Kenyan guy that was also on the ground. He was okay. Oh. Um, and then I realized that he just strolled straight onto the inside of the track. And while he was in lane, he didn't, didn't look either way. And I just, uh, and, um, uh, he blamed me at the start. But then I said to him, I, you know, I said, mate, like I, I looked, there was no one on the bend uh, 20, yeah. 10 seconds ago. What happened? And it was all good. Neither of us were severely hurt. I had a pretty bad graze on my back, but otherwise I was fine. That's good. It didn't like take you out or anything. That's No, nothing, nothing's put me out of action for anything. The other two times yeah. I just destroyed the skin on both of my hands. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, geez. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's what happens when you, you do as many videos as you've done. I mean, it's just bound to happen eventually because that's yeah. just, one yeah, it's kind of risky. 95 yeah. videos or something like that. So, you know. Yeah, one yeah. in every thirty, one in every thirty-five. I'm gonna come down, I guess. Yeah, because I often do. I am pretty ambitious with some of the angles I try and film at sometimes. So yeah, you're yeah. getting close. You're getting close, which is good. Yeah, you got to get the angles, man. Um, <laughs> last question. I think you you kind of answered this when I asked in the DMs, but I, you know, for the listeners, who was one of your favorite athletes to uh, be around in video for the channel? Yeah, the first one that comes to mind is Sam Long, who we just talked about. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's just he's really he's really good fun. Um uh Parker Stinson is is really uh is really fun to be around. Paul Chalimo for sure. I don't even remember who I gave you as an answer in the DMs. Who did I say? Oh uh, a guy from Great Britain. What's his oh, name? Oh Andy Butchard. Andy Butchard, yeah, yeah, Andy Butchard, yeah. Of course. He's yeah. right up there. He is he is a very funny character and just very uh just yeah, very very uh, very fun to be be around as well. Um but there's a lot. There's a lot uh, I could I could mention. I, I really like hanging around Morgan Pearson. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot I could I could say. Jack Rowe, even yeah. in the UK, I've only filmed him once, but I hope to I hope to work with him again. He's an up and coming um, British British runner. Uh, Jake yeah. Smith is also uh, very funny. He's uh, he's run sixty minutes per half. Uh, young guy from the UK. So yeah, there's plenty. So, yeah, it seems like you've met a lot of really cool people. So it's hard to pick one as your favorite. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. That's that's all I had today. Um, Thanks so much for another great chat. Wow, almost an hour has flown flown by. I Ooh. know. I, I was like, I yeah. thought this one was going to be like thirty minutes because I didn't have like I didn't have to go through a background or like you know we already we did the fun thing last time, so they already know the answers to that. So yeah, I thought it was yeah. going to be shorter, but here we are. Yeah, uh, no, time flies. So back on. Uh, 
I really appreciate everything that you're doing. And I know that Nick, uh, Nick had a good time on your podcast and uh, hopefully you'll catch up with him again soon. Although he's got a very hectic schedule with travel over the next few weeks. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. I reached out to him. We'll, we'll get, we'll make it happen. Just we'll see when, but yeah. um, nonetheless, thank you for coming on again. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll have to talk after several, you know, we'll just yeah. keep this thing rolling. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to, man. Thanks so much once again. Yeah. I hope you bounce back from your injury quick and best of luck with your buildup. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. All right. See ya. Bye.